the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 1 and the first 17 verses. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Ezron, Ezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amimadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Ezekiah. Ezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers of the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matan. Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And this is the word of the Lord. It's a short reading from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I've come. It's written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. After the service over coffee, um, I will be doing something that I intended to do last week over our Christmas dinner. I shall be dishing out joy to the world Christmas chocolate angels. So even if you can only stay for a few moments afterwards, Please do connect, collect your Christmas angels. Um, we have a lot more than people who are actually here today because of uh, the fact that people are away for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Now, when I was thinking about this passage, it occurred to me that any sermon about Christmas is ultimately about Jesus but Jesus really doesn't take that much part in any of the stories. First of all, he is not born. And then when he is born, he probably just laid in the manger gurgling, as uh, babies are likely to do. We have that section in uh, Away in a Manger that said that Jesus, no crying he makes. And I'm not buying into that. I've never, never come across a baby that didn't cry. And we must remember that whilst God were, sorry, whilst Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. And men, when they are babies, cry. And over the years, I've preached sermons about Mary and her connection to Jesus, about the shepherds and their connection to Jesus, and indeed there will be a sermon about the shepherds tomorrow, and about the wise men, or the three kings, or the magi, or whatever you want to call them, which will come up around the end of Epiphany. But somebody I've never um, preached a sermon on as best I remember is Joseph. And so today I'm going to turn my attention to Joseph. And as well as this being sparked, I hope, by God and by the Bible, it was also sparked by our good friend Paul Cookson, who came and did a, a poetry event for the children a few weeks ago, in that he wrote a poem uh, that he centered in on Joseph. And this particular phrase in the passage where Joseph is said to be a man who was faithful to the law. Now, that's perhaps not the best translation of what it is trying to say about Joseph. But if we take that idea and add in like spice in a Christmas pudding, the idea that J Joseph was a righteous man and the idea that Joseph was a good man, those three ideas pretty much encapsulate what the Greek language is trying to say. And usually when we come to Christmas, Mary is there holding the baby and Joseph is off somewhere over her shoulder or behind her back or something like that. But I want to say that just as Mary can be a suitable role model for Christian women everywhere, then Joseph can be a suitable role model for Christian men everywhere. Now imagine you've got a girlfriend 
you know, I mean, in Gary's case, I'm sure the list of girlfriends over the years goes on and on and on. All the ones that Fab doesn't know about. And one day, one of your girlfriends comes to you and says, I'm pregnant and it's not your baby. That would be a tough thing. You know, enough if you were in love with a lady and not dating her or, as we say in Yorkshire, courting her. But something else again, if you are betrothed. The closest we have in English culture is the idea of engagement. And we're told that Joseph, because he was a righteous man, a good man, had in mind to divorce her quietly. He didn't want to put her to shame. But God had different ideas. And so... Whilst the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, had appeared to Mary while she was awake, the angel appeared to Joseph in his dream. Now again, this is quite difficult, because if you have a dream then when you awake, sometimes you're inclined to forget it, and sometimes you want to forget it, because if you're like me, I sometimes have some bad dreams, unpleasant dreams. And I wake up during the night, and I'll think, that was horrible, I don't want to go to sleep again, in case I have a... Um, Another unpleasant dream. There's a scene in that classic British comedy, uh, Father Ted, which is always an appropriate thing to mention as we come to Christmas because obviously it's based around the story of a priest. And uh, the priest is in bed, Ted that is, and... Uh, he is having a romantic dream about committing his life to a lady who is played by an actress that you might remember who was in Bally Kiss Angel many years ago called Dervla Kerwin. And he has decided that he is going to leave the priesthood because he is Roman Catholic and he is going to marry. And at that moment, one of his fellow priests, the thick one, comes over and shakes him and wakes him from his dream to ask him if he wants a peanut. And he says, Dougal, just go back to sleep. And, Fre and Ted settles down to try and pick up his G dream where he left it, only to find out that he has another dream of being chased along the hillside by peanuts with arms and legs and uh, truly terrifying dream peanuts that are six foot tall but there was always the danger I guess that Joseph might forget his dream might think it was some kind of wish fulfillment you know you're Betrothed is not pregnant because she's been with another man. She is pregnant because God has worked with her and she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is a very difficult idea to grasp and to understand. And the Bible tells us nothing really more of what that means or what it involves. But Joseph 
hung on to his dream. And he decided that it was from God. And when he woke up, we're told in verse 24, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But even then it says in verse 25, he did not consummate their marriage until, the give, until she gave birth to a son. If you don't know what consummate means, then ask Francis afterwards. He will tell you what it means. <laughs> no, he won't, he says. No, he won't. Ask Gary instead. Um, <laughs> I'm picking on Gary today. But... Uh, I guess we all know. But it reminds us very much that the idea of the virgin birth is not an optional extra in this story. It is not something that we can put away or put to one side. Some people have said, oh well, the Bible only talks about a virgin birth because it is kind of an attempt to fulfill something that the prophets said, that the virgin would be with child. But the word that is translated as virgin from the Old Testament could equally be translated maiden. Now, uh, maiden has some ideas of virginity about it, but also could simply mean young lady. And so we're in this situation where Matthew and Luke, who are the ones who tell us the Christmas story, have no axe to grind to prove that Mary was a virgin, other than to tell us the history of what actually happened you know there's a line in a song that i know that says history is his story and that's kind of a sweet thing and what we have in the bible is not history in the normal sense you'll search in vain for details of the battle of hastings or any of that but it is the history of salvation. And that's why I read for you that long genealogy this morning. I mean, I know you all love genealogy. I see all the time where it's one of the main hobbies of people in this country now. And I wonder if the reason it is so popular is because people have lost sight of God they kind of revere their ancestors. There's a long tradition in the world of ancestor worship. I hope it has not become center of British culture. But in and of itself, genealogy is not a problem. And the genealogy that Matthew listed tells us of the way that Jesus' line... As it says at the beginning, he was the son of David and the son of Abraham. And then it lists so many of the well-known figures and the not-so-well-known figures of Hebrew history, of Jewish history. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and his brothers. And then we find ourselves in a situation where Rahab is mentioned in that. Rahab, in case you didn't know, is a lady. And not, well, that is maybe debatable. She was a woman prostitute. And this emphasizes the way that Jesus comes to people of all kinds. It says a few verses later, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. 
Now, there were some very great and commendable things to remark about David, but the day when he saw a woman bathing naked on her rooftop was perhaps not one of them. And the day when he sent her husband out to battle in order that she would suddenly become a widow and then he could marry her himself is certainly not one of them. Many of the Jewish kings who are mentioned were men who failed God in many ways, even though they were an ancestor of Jesus. And then it comes down to the idea that Joseph's father was Jacob, and Joseph was the husband of Mary. So even Joseph, who was not in any sense truly the father of the child, gets a part to play in salvation history. And then it says Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. You know, it's interesting that um, when we say mother of Jesus in our kind of churches, that feels fine. But when some other churches say mother of God, we kind of shudder a little. But again, we should note that Jesus was the man who was fully man and fully God. I passed a church the other day on my way to visiting Peter and uh, it had a sign on it which was rather out of date, a sign that said, the millennium is Jesus' 2000th birthday. And I'm thinking that obviously went up 23 years ago. Shame they couldn't have updated it. I didn't even know if the church was still open. But if we can talk about Jesus who has gone on forever having a birthday 2,000 years ago after he took after 2,000 years after he took on the flesh, then I think anything is perhaps up for grabs when we talk about this wonderful man who came into the world. Joseph plays a wonderful role. He is a good man, not least because he submits to God's will. And at Christmas time, as we deal with God, we can do far worse than take Joseph as a role model in that he submits to God's will and perhaps even hope that an angel with a different message might come to us in a dream. But the height of this story, because as I said, everything in a Christmas sermon ultimately relates and centers in on Jesus. The height is in verse 23, when it says, the virgin will conceive a son, I'm sorry, conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And this is the wonderful thing that we remember at Christmas time that from the day he was born, God, who had always been with us, was with us in a very special sense. And from that day until a time approximately 33 years later when he was crucified, God was with us in amazing ways. But God is still with us today because we are told that those who believe will receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, if we are willing and submit ourselves, 
will fill our lives. And God will be with us in even more amazing ways when someday, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, maybe in a hundred years' time, Jesus will come upon the clouds of heaven and then the end of the world will come and salvation history will be complete when Pat and Francis and Jenny and Linus, Isabel and Merlin and Jill and anybody else that I've not mentioned will be with God for all eternity in heavenly places. That is the wonderful culmination of this story, which takes us far beyond the virgin birth and reiterates that God is with us and God will be with us in the person of Jesus now and forever. Amen.